We are going to start off again with a short presentation by Melissa Kane, who's going to talk about the third party factor in this election. Welcome, Melissa Kane, please. Thank you, everyone. We're just going to take a few minutes before uh, the other panelists get on stage and talk about third party runs, because it's something we hear a lot about and want to talk through some of the data, some of the myths. Uh, we're going to agree with some of them. We're going to dispel a few of them. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm not going to hide the ball from you. I think that uh, what you're going to see through the data is that it is probably not a good idea for Donald Trump to run as a third party candidate, <laughs> which doesn't mean he won't. Uh, but it does mean that it would probably not be a good idea. But what the, the sort of better idea, uh, or maybe the more plausible scenario, is for a, an establishment candidate to actually run as a third party candidate should Trump get the nomination. And we're going to talk about why that is and how that works out. All right, so today we're going to talk, we're going to just define a few terms. Um, I'm going to talk through, there are about four ways to get on the ballot. People don't realize there are actually lots of ways to get on the ballot, about four different ways to get on the ballot. And then I'm going to explain to you the establishment spoiler, the, the little part of that thing called the U.S. Constitution that none of us have read since sixth grade. And we're going to go through a little bit of that. So number one, when we talk about elections, we're talking about the general election. I know the primary is coming up. That's what we're all thinking about. But remember today, we're just talking about the, uh, the November election. And we're also talking about electors this time, not delegates. And we're also going to be talking about outsider versus insider. We're just really talking about sort of establishment versus anti-establishment. Because on the Democratic side, there doesn't seem to be much of a, a stomach for a third party run. Okay, so we're going to sort of put those aside. And we're, so today we're going to talk about the tension within the Republican Party between outsider, insider, establishment, anti-establishment. Okay, so there are four ways to get on the ballot. Number one, is to create your own party. Just call it a Trump Republican party and just say and go through and you have to submit signatures and you have to submit some some documents to your state to your secretary of state to do this, but it can be done. Now, here's the problem. The states you see there in yellow represent about 190 electoral college votes. Those are states where the deadline to sort of create your Trump Republican Party has passed by the time the GOP convention is held, right? So if you decide, if he were to decide, or anyone were to decide at the convention, I don't like how this is going, I'm going to do my own thing, you've already forfeited 190 electoral college votes, right? So the states in orange are the states where you could still try to get your Trump Republican Party on the ballot after that. So the bottom line there is you got to start early if you want to go down this road. And the great thing about this option is that the party doesn't have to name its candidate. You could just put the party on there as a placeholder, right? And then name your candidate later. And that's why this is good. This would actually be really good leverage to hold over a convention. Um, if someone were thinking to do that, um, to say, if you don't elect me, I'm just going to put my name on my Trump Republican Party ballot in all of these states and forget it. So uh, that's the benefit of this. Again, is sort of you don't have to name your candidate right away. But again, the downside is that the deadlines are really against you if you don't decide until the convention. All right, so the next way to be on the party is maybe my favorite, and because it really relies on the efforts of other people, uh, is, to, is to hitchhike with another party. Uh, there are actually a couple of parties that are already on the ballot with Californians. When we go to our ballot, there's Peace and Freedom Party, there's Libertarian Party, there's other parties aside from Republicans and Democrats. So uh, a Republican candidate or conservative candidate could try to hitchhike along with um, for example, the Constitution Party. Now, this is a sort of Christian-based, very conservative party. They're on the ballot in about 17 states, um, representing about 190, I'm sorry, 150 delegates. So the red states you see there are states that the Constitution Party is already on. The yellow states is where they're trying, and the purple states are where they're suing. And so... <laughs> That's America. This is what we do. Uh, so there's a the Constitution Party. That's an option, right? If you wanted to get on, you could just convince those guys to be to let you on. And this is the Libertarian Party. Okay, so they're on even more states. 32 states, and they have access to about 332 electoral votes already. Problem with the Libertarian Party is it would take a lot of sweet talking, let's face it, to be like, I woke up this morning and I decided Deep down, I'm really a libertarian. And I decided all this the day after the Republican convention where I was really mad 
And it's just, it just, it was a coincidence. And anyway, I'm really a libertarian. Please let me be on your ballot. Um, it would take a lot of, uh, a lot of sweet talking. But the biggest problem with the hitchhike scenario, which again is still, still in the works, is that the Constitution Party picks their delegate, picks their presidential nominee in April, and the libertarians do it in May. And so. That ship is a bit, has sailed a bit if you wait until, the, until the, uh, the, the GOP convention. Okay, so the third way to be on is to run as an independent. And that's really kind of what we think about when you hear people talking about um, an independent run, a third party run. This is somebody who's just running, that's like, just like your name, just Mitt Romney, that's it. Like not any sort of party affiliation at all, just that particular name. And this is the one where you often hear experts say it's too late to try. Right, it's just a uh, ship of sail. And they're kind of right. Um, if you want to win 270 electoral votes, it is probably too late to try, but we're gonna talk about why that might not be the case. Um, if you look, for example, in the red states there, those are states where the deadline to run as an independent will have elapsed by the day of the convention. So again, if you show up at the convention and you say, I'm gonna take my toys and go home, I'm just gonna run as an independent, you've already forfeited 159 electoral votes. All right, and then to make matters worse, in August, so like two weeks after the convention is over, you have to then produce thousands of signatures in order to get on the ballot. So even those blue states that you see there who represent August, those are states where you have to turn in a bunch of signatures in order to get on the ballot. So again, very, very difficult. And if you look here, uh, sorry, this is a... Um, oh, why am I pointing over there? Okay, the, this is a map um, showing sort of signature requirements. For example, Tennessee, it's like 200 signatures to be on the ballot. Like, we could all be on the ballot in Tennessee. <laughs> like, but then in California, it's more than 170,000 signatures to be on the ballot. So it really varies. But in total, you'd need a, almost a million signatures to get on the ballot in every state. It's a big undertaking. And again, one you'd have to start like right now if you wanted to do it. So when you hear people say, oh, it's too late to run as an independent, they're kind of right. Again, if you wanted to win 270 electoral votes, this is probably, this ship is going to have sailed by the convention. Okay. Okay. And the last way to do this, this is sort of the easiest and the hardest way, is to run as a great American write-in. Okay, and so a lot, some states don't allow write-ins at all. If you write in a candidate, they will ignore it. Now, but those are very few. They only represent about 50 electoral college votes. Then there are states where you don't have to do anything to be on the ballot as a write-in. You can do like whatever it is, they're gonna count it. Donald Duck, we'll count it, we'll just find. Well, he's the winner, he's the winner. Uh, there are no requirements. So there's actually a pretty low threshold in a number of states to even be a write-in. And then for states that do require some kind of registration, and it's just like a one-page thing, like this is super easy stuff, but the deadlines are in, as you can see, green and blue represent September and October. So if you look at the maps, see there's a lot of green and blue. The majority are in September, October. So if you were mad at the convention, this might be a really good way to go because you could still try and do a sort of ground game to get your write-in votes, although that gets tricky with the, elect with the uh, electric voting machines, but anyway. Uh, so, so, the, so that's the fourth way, again, to be on the ballot. So to recap, if you wait until the convention, it is almost impossible to get 270 electoral college votes as a sort of non-Democrat or Republican candidate. But that might not actually be your plan. And that's where we get into something I call the establishment spoiler. All right. so. You need 270 electoral college votes to win. If no one gets 270 electoral college votes, no one is the president. Okay, if you get 269, you don't get any credit for being super popular. Uh, 270 is it, and if you don't get it, then you're not the president. So if an independent candidate were to get in and do just enough to prevent anyone else from getting 270, no one is the president. Okay, so what happens how fun, uh, so, <laughs> and scary, and weird, but okay. Uh, so, so what happens if no one gets those 270 votes? Are oh, you gonna love this. Uh, the House of Representatives decides. Congress, right? They're smart and awesome, we love them, right? Uh, so, I know. Now, I went to Georgia Public School, but I cannot be the only person surprised by this piece of information. So, the House of Representatives actually gets to vote, and just so you know, the Senate 
elects the vice president, the house represents the president, uh, elects the president. So here's, and here's two other weird things about it. With the house, if this were thrown into chaos and the house were stuck electing the president, there are two things you should know. Number one, they have to choose from the candidates who actually ran, right? They can't just say, John Zipperer, you are amazing. Please save our country and be our president. <laughs> Sadly, Sadly, you have to have actually been a candidate. And number two is you're gonna love this Californians, every state gets one vote, right? So the one dude, the one congressman from Wyoming, same vote as like our entire congressional delegation. OMG. Okay, so uh, needless to say, this kind of thing was negotiated by, negotiated by Rhode Island when the Constitution was being written, and that is not, a, that's totally true. Okay, so, uh, so each state gets a vote. Now, if you look at the states, and by the way, it's the current Congress. It is not the one that's fixing to come in. It's the one that is sitting in November, December this year who would decide. All right, so if you look right now, the GOP sort of is the majority of congressional, a majority of the House of Representatives, uh, representatives in 33 states. They're all the red ones. The blue ones are dominated by Republicans. All right, so let's go back to our hypothetical. You have Hillary Clinton, you have Donald Trump, and you have this establishment candidate, sort of third party independent person. Like, let's, let's Let's, let's say Mitt Romney, or maybe somebody else who might be popular in the House of Representatives. Anyone have a idea? Maybe Paul Ryan. All right, so Paul Ryan, you got a Paul Ryan, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton walk into a bar. Uh, or, <laughs> they, walk, they walk into the House of Representatives. Uh, who is the House going to vote for? Right? It ain't Hillary, and it ain't Trump. Right? It throws it back to Paul Ryan, and that is how, a, a, if Trump were to get the nomination, the establishment could run a third party and cobble together between the write-in votes and maybe some of those late deadlines on those independent races, they could cobble together enough, enough ballot presence to be on enough states to just prevent the other candidates from getting those 270 votes and in that way actually end up winning. Now, would it be a fiasco? Yes. Would people be like, would it be bananas? Yes, I don't think anyone wants this to be the scenario, by the way. But you can bet if the convention comes and Trump is actually the nominee, there are going to be some relatively desperate people who are saying, you know what, if this is our only hope to to throw this to the House of Representatives and hope that they will like us better, uh, then that is certainly an option. Now, if you're Trump and you want to do this, understand, I think, and again, it's not, I predicting Trump is like not a thing any of us, any of us should do, but, uh, but, but if he's actually doing the calculations, a third party, he might threaten a third party run, but the truth is if he did, it would be too late to win outright. So all he would do, it would be to either throw the election to Clinton, confirming a lot of people's <laughs> conspiracy theories about him, uh, or, <laughs> or throw it to the establishment candidate, whoever robs him at the convention. So it's a less likely scenario. The thing to look out for, actually, when we talk about third party and independent candidates, is actually an establishment candidate running to sort of to throw this to a more friendly, uh, a more friendly place. And I don't think any of this is what the founding fathers had in mind, <laughs> necessarily, um, but it is a possibility. So when you read about it, when you hear these things, um, that's sort of, that's the data, and that is the more likely scenario when it comes to sort of third party or independence. All right, um, yeah, that's it. All right, thank you, thank you.